convention of states. What is that? Well, there are a couple of different ways to amend the Constitution. And uh, goodness knows uh, we need to rework the way we do things in this country. And hence, we have this uh, movement or organization, the Convention of States. And Mr. Meckler is here tonight to tell us how to save our republic using the Constitution. Let me tell you just a little bit about Mr. Meckler, and this is the part where I have to use my notes. Uh, well, maybe I don't. Let's see how good my memory is. Uh, he was born in California, and like uh, a number of our friends, who people in this room know, he somehow, uh, through uh, accident or on purpose, managed to escape the land of fruit and nuts. <laughs> and uh, he is in, based out of Texas right now, so he's come up here from Texas for this event. He uh, got his uh, Bachelor of uh, Arts degree at uh, San Diego State University and his law degree at uh, McGeorge Law School. And uh, he's co-founder of Tea Party Patriots, along with uh, other names who you might recognize, like Jenny Beth Martin. Uh, he's also the founder of an organization known as Citizens for Self-Governance. And this is an interesting organization. Uh, some of you remember well, just a few years ago, especially any of you who were involved in the Tea Party movement directly, like our group up on the Cape, we call the Upper Cape Tea Party, uh, we debated becoming a 501c3 organization ourselves, or a, a C4 organization. But at that time, uh, as we know, under the previously scandal-free <laughs> White House administration, <laughs> there was undue pressure and undue inquiry uh, to conservative groups like Tea Party groups. And uh, we know some famous stories about uh, the kind of shenanigans that went on. Mr. Meckler's group that he founded, the Citizens for Self-Governance, uh, actually filed a lawsuit in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And uh, in front of a three-judge panel, and correct me if I'm wrong here, in front of a three-judge panel, uh, a unanimous decision was taken to rebuke the IRS. And I don't know what the final outcome of that was, if there were actually uh, financial restoration or anything like that, but perhaps Mark will mention that for just a moment. He's a proponent of the Convention of States under Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution. So uh, you can amend the Constitution by uh, proposing an amendment, having it ratified uh, in the House and in the Senate, and then out to the states, or the states can convene a, cons a constitutional convention and actually amend the Constitution through that, uh, I don't want to call it an alternate route or a second route, through that other route. Um, so as I said, uh, Mark Meckler is here this evening to talk to us about how to save our republic using the Constitution. He's going to tell us about his, his Convention of States movement, and uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Mark Meckler. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me tonight. I appreciate that you will uh, accept a Westerner out here on the East Coast. I do have roots here, by the way, which is kind of interesting. So my wife uh, was born in Millis, and that's where the whole family is. Only her mom and dad moved out to the West Coast. She was about eight years old when they moved out. So one of the things I love about coming here is I feel at home because it's like being with my family. My whole family has a Massachusetts accent, and that culture lives very strong for us on the West Coast. So they brought that with them. It's kind of interesting because Patty... My wife was raised in San Diego, California. She's really the only Californian among them, and she's definitely different than the rest of the family. And one of the things I really love about coming to the East Coast, and especially small towns on the East Coast, is that it reminds me of small towns everywhere. You know, I travel all across the country. I'm on the road about probably 60% of the time. I've been in 45 states in the last couple of years. I watch the news, just like all of you, and what I see on the news I just don't actually recognize for the most part. Because mostly I travel around to smaller towns around the country, places like this, and I meet the real people in there. Not the people who live in the coastal enclaves, not the media elite, not the folks that we see on TV in Washington, D.C. I meet what I consider real, regular Americans. And in America today, in small communities like this all across the country, the kindness, the love, the gentility, the helpful neighborly spirit that existed at the founding of this country still exists in America. So one thing I want to do is I hope to be a harbinger of hope. I travel a lot, like I said, and I, when I turn on the news, when I go back to my hotel tonight in Boston, I'm going to turn on the news, it's going to be nothing but bad. 
right? We're not going to see anything good on the news tonight. We don't ever see anything good on the news. But I just want you to know that when I travel around the country, when I meet all over the country are people just like you. And I meet people just like you in small towns, but also in big cities. You know, I can tell you I've been in Manhattan. I've been meetings in Manhattan. There are people just like you in Manhattan. There might be a smaller minority of people <laughs> like us in places like that. But I speak in Berkeley, California. I speak in San Francisco. I speak, I live outside of Austin, Texas, a very liberal town. Great conservative people who love America and love what America stands for. And those roots are especially deep, obviously, here in the East. Coming to a place like this, coming to Massachusetts, we come to the birthplace of America. It's really incredible to be in a place like this. You know, today, we went out and saw the tallest granite monument on earth. It was incredible. Mike took us out there. And it's so amazing to me to see on the top of that monument one word, and one word only, which is faith. Right? At the top of that monument, it says faith. Underneath that is everything else. The law, morality, justice, education. But on top of all of that is faith. That's the foundation on which this country was built. And I know, I appreciate we the people, they're bringing you history, they're bringing you what our Constitution was meant to be, what it's all about, and that's a historical perspective, so I, I feel indulge me, I'm going to start by going way back in history. I will tell you a little bit more about myself, but we're going to go way back before I was born in history. I want to go back to the American Revolution, a time that I think people in this area understand a lot better than people around the rest of the country. But my favorite story from the American Revolution is one that almost nobody knows. And when we study American history, and you might have to forgive me, I went to public school in Los Angeles, California, so I might be weaker on history than most. But when we study American history, we study it from what I call the great man perspective of history, the great woman, the, the great movers of history. We study about the revolution. We study, of course, Washington, Adams, and Madison. Uh, we all know Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech. These are the great monumental orators, the warriors, the leaders of the American Revolution. And all of us know those names. But at any great moment in, a, in the history of a country, and certainly in the history of this country, there are far more people that were involved in that moment than we know, than we will ever know. And think of the, the numbers of people that were involved in the American Revolution, and how few of them we actually know their names, how few we know their stories. Those stories are not really collected. These are just the regular people of the revolution. There are people who were farmers and merchants and you know, just regular folks. They're actually people like us. And I think it's really important that we know their stories. And the reason I think that's so important is, I, I don't know about you, but when I read stories of the indispensable man, George Washington, I read stories of the incredible order that Patrick Henry was. He was so, he so mesmerized his audiences that they would pay people to take notes and the note takers would actually forget to take the notes. And I think about those kinds of people, people like Thomas Jefferson, who was so learned, or Madison, who was so learned. And when I think about those people, it's hard for me to imagine myself being one of those people. And they're just... We've almost deified them. They're giants in history across the eons. And so when I think about those people, it's, I feel a little bit dwarfed and a little bit overwhelmed. And like, what am I supposed to do? And I think, where, where are those men right now? Right? Where, where are those kinds of people right now? But the truth is, those are just the ones we know about. In my opinion, more important are the regular people. People like Captain Levi Preston. And Preston was a captain in the Continental Army. We know his story because in 1843, long after the end of the American Revolution, there was a young school teacher by the name of Mellon Chamberlain. Chamberlain was traveling around the country collecting the stories of the last living Minutemen. Well, you think about that, 1843, they were old, especially for then. Late 80s, early 90s, we all know people that age right now and they seem young. But back then, average life expectancy was 54. I mean, somebody who was in their 80s or 90s was ancient. It was like Methuselah to them. <laughs> so he's traveling around, he's collecting these stories because there's no YouTube, right? There's no video, there's no tape recorder. There's no way to get their stories unless you sit down with them and write down their stories. And so uh, Chamberlain comes across Preston. He's retired, he's living in North Carolina. And he asks him a series of questions about the American Revolution and why he fought in the Revolution. Now, you and I know why the American Revolution happened, because we learned about it in school. We learned about the Stamp Act, right? We all know what that is. Is it? It's not on. No, I've got it on here. We're not getting anything on the mic? No, I'm getting it. She's getting it there. Am I supposed to be wearing a second mic? I see another lava up here. If you guys need me to, let me know. Yeah, no? 
<laughs> I don't know. All right, Eric, Eric's not getting it on the match. Uh, well, you tell me what I need to do, and we can we can adjust on the fly. Do you want me to try the handheld too? On the box. How's that? It's it's lit up. Can you hear me now? Okay. Well, you tell me. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> So he, he's asking a question about the revolution, and we all know why the revolution was fought. You guys all learned this in school. We learned about the Stamp Act, right? So offensive, they had to buy these stamps and put them on documents. We learned about the tax on tea that led to the Boston Tea Party. We learned that they were reading the great writers, of, you know, Thomas Paine, Common Sense. They were reading the historical writers, Milton and Burke and Montesquieu and all these people on liberty. So we knew about all this stuff. We've been taught all this stuff. And by the way... Mellon Chamberlain had been taught the exact same thing. It's only 1843, but he knows the same things you and I know about the American Revolution. Only in his telling, it wasn't right. So he asked Captain Levi Preston a series of questions, and he recounts this story, by the way, 50 years after he asked the questions in the North Church in Danvers. It's a very famous site, and it's on the anniversary of the beginning of the American Revolution, the shot fired around the world. That better? All right. So he asked this series of questions. He asked Captain Preston, on that day when you went out to meet the Red Coast, why did you go? You were a young man, you had everything to lose, you had a family, you had a farm, but you certainly weren't a soldier. And yet you went out to fight the greatest fighting force ever assembled, the greatest armed, the greatest paid, the greatest fed, the greatest trained fighting force ever assembled, and you went out to fight them. Why did you go? Was it the Stamp Act? And Captain Preston says, Stamps? I never bought one of them. Governor Bernard locked him in the armory, and I'm sure we never saw them again. <laughs> That's surprising. Chamberlain was surprised by that. He says, well, maybe it was a tax on tea. He said, tea? We never drank any tea, son. I was a farmer. We knew the boys threw it in the harbor, but that was that. So it's not the Boston Tea Party. It's not the tax on tea. It's not the Stamp Act. He says, well, maybe you were reading the great revolutionaries, Milton and Burke, and you were reading Thomas Paine, and he says, these men you speak of, I never heard of them. We read the Psalms, the Bible, the Almanac, but that's about it. And so Chamberlain's very surprised because he knows what we know about the American Revolution. This is what he's been taught. And so he goes big. And he says, well, maybe it was the heavy hand of British tyranny. You were just tired of, tired of living under the boot of British tyranny. Preston says, tyranny never felt a weight of it. <laughs> what was it? And so he asked him, well, what was it when you went out to fight the Red Coast? What was it that brought you out that day? The president says what I think is the most succinct summary of the political philosophy of the American Revolution ever stated by anybody from then until this day. And he said this, son, when we went out to fight them redcoats that day, we meant only one thing. We had always governed ourselves and we always intended to. And them redcoats, they intended that we shouldn't. Very simple, beautiful, the essence of of the American Revolution was the fight for self-governance. The American Revolution is entirely unique in the history of revolutions in the world, in the history of man. And here's why. Revolutions are generally fought to throw off the chains of bondage. Usually it's because a nation has been conquered, a people have been conquered, and they've lived under a conquering power for so long as slaves, as subjects, as second-class citizens, that they rise up and throw off the chains of bondage. But not, not the colonists. Not the colonists. We think of the British government as a tyrannical government. Read the literature of the time. There's a great historian by the name of Bernard Balin, my famous historian on this period. And Balin writes only and reads only from the actual original writings of the founders and the people who were alive at the time. And if you read the pamphleteers of the time, read what they said about the British system of governance. It's incredible. I only discovered this in the last couple of years. Here's what the pamphleteers, both in Britain and in the colonies, were saying about the British system of governance. Generally speaking, using phraseology, something like this. The greatest system of government ever invented by mankind for the preservation of liberty. That's what they're saying about the monarchy, about parliament, about their court system. That's what they're saying about it. Right, which is incredible. We think they hated the British. The British, they were so proud of being British subjects, being part of the British Empire. Remember the British Empire, the height of technology, the height of commerce, the height of culture from the British Empire. They were trying to imitate the British here in the colonies. We think of them as hating the British generally, but that's not true. They loved that system of governance. These were free men and women fighting to remain free. 
very unusual for a revolution. What had happened, what caused the American Revolution if it was not the Stamp Act and the tea tax if it was not British tyranny, general, what caused it to happen? There was a pivotal moment in American history that actually is the pivotal moment that causes the American Revolution. And it's a moment called the Declaratory Acts. You guys familiar with that? Raise your hand if you know what the Declaratory Acts are. Very few people. This is really an interesting thing. Declaratory Acts is a piece of legislation passed by Parliament, promoted by the King, and it says something really interesting. It says that no matter what, we can tell you, the colonists, what to do under any circumstance whatsoever, and you have nothing to say about it. And then it imposes nothing. There's not a tax. There's no penalty attached to it. Nothing's ever done with it. It's never enforced. It's never utilized. Nothing. And this causes the American Revolution. And it causes the American Revolution primarily because a guy named Sam Adams. And not the beer maker Sam Adams. And <laughs> Sam Adams, one of our founding fathers, my favorite revolutionary, because he wasn't some huge intellectual. He was a little bit of kind of an off guy, a little bit of a loser, a little bit of a drunk. Sam Adams is the narrator of the American Revolution. Narrative matters. Sam Adams is the guy that coined the term the Boston Massacre. Not exactly a massacre, right? Generally caused by the colonists first. But Sam Adams realizes that this is a pivotal moment in American history, and this moment, when the Declaratory Act issues, is the difference between slavery and freedom. Because if somebody else can tell you what to do in all circumstances whatsoever, and you have absolutely no choice, and they tell you that, and you accede to that, then by very definition, you have become a slave. Am I right about that? So Great Britain has just by statement declared that the colonists are slaves. Sam Adams says, this cannot stand, and this is where the American Revolution is generally and genuinely ignited. This is an incredible thing. Where, now, where does this come from? Because to me, this is really interesting. Self-governance, the idea of self-governance. Where does self-governance come from? We can look at the entire arc of human history. There are almost no examples of this in all of human history. You, in fact, if you look at the series of governments that, that form and fall apart throughout human history, you have to go all the way back to the period of Judges in the Old Testament. To actually see self-governance. This is how the Lord set up government, right? So in other words, choose people from among yourselves. What's that called? Consent of the governed. Choose people from among yourselves. And, and that's where we get the period of the judges. There were no rulers. That was a time when the judges judged and the people followed and listened voluntarily, right? But until then, government had always been imposed on people. And you end up here in, in the colonies where the people can develop the idea of self-governance. So when I heard Levi Preston's statement... And he said that we'd always govern ourselves and we always intended to. I wondered, where's that come from? It wasn't that way in Britain. The people didn't govern themselves, right? It was a class society and the, the ruling elite, the landed elite, the gentry ruled, the lords ruled, the king ruled, parliament ruled, the house of lords ruled. They didn't really have much of a choice about it. It's not like they were electing people. So where does this idea of self-governance actually come from? And so I wanted to study the history of America prior to the American Revolution. And you can go online, you can try and find books about this, not much out there. It's really incredible. I've talked to a bunch of people, asked them, what do you know about the history of America prior to Plymouth, right? Prior, prior to the first settlement, what do you know about it before the Mayflower Compact? And most people know nothing. I didn't learn anything in school about that. You know, in school I learned about Jamestown, the Mayflower Compact, Plymouth, all this stuff. And then the next major event is the American Revolution. Think back to your childhood and what you learned in history, whether it was in grammar school or middle school, high school, college. That's the way we teach American history. So that when I started to look at that, I thought, well, how far is it from Plymouth to the American Revolution? How many years? Anybody in here roughly know how many years that is? 150. 150. There's always at least one really smart person who knows that in the crowd. When I got asked that question the first time, five, six years ago, it's like, you know, I went to the dusty file cabinets in my mind, and I looked there, and there was nothing there. <laughs> Literally nothing there. I had no idea. 75 years, 100 years, 110 years. I had no idea, because I had never been taught anything about that. So it's 150, I think historians would peg it at 158 is what they would say, 158 years between uh, the Mayflower Compact and the first shot in the American Revolution. So the question is, what happened? Almost no history books written about that time. That's because nothing happened, right? <laughs> there was nothing going on here in the colonies for 158 years. No, that's of course not what happened. 
What happened historically when you really dig in is we figured out how to govern ourselves. Because here we were on a new continent, right? We had some structures in our mind that we had brought from the old countries and we had some ideas about liberty and freedom, but we were here and we were pretty much on our own. It was a really unusual circumstance, right? We didn't break away from another country that was geographically next door. We didn't have institutions imposed upon us. You guys have heard the term benign neglect, which is kind of what the crown practiced that let us be on our own far away. What else could they do? You know, across an ocean. And so we had had to figure it out. So we had this incredible, beautiful, amazing flowering over 158 years of self-governance, of people who had always governed themselves and always intended to. So by the time it comes to Levi Preston's town, I want you to think about that. Levi Preston's a farmer, and he decides how to live his own life. Nobody tells him how to live his own life, how to raise his family, what he can do with his land. Nobody tells him that stuff. Nobody told his daddy that stuff. Nobody told his granddad or his granddad's dad and granddad. It's unimaginable to a man like Levi Preston that somebody could actually declare that they could tell him what to do. That is self-governance. That's in his heart. It's in the American DNA. I would argue it's in the American DNA still today. Today, we watch what's going on in Washington, D.C., and we listen to them tell us what to do. Right? And they tell us a lot. 60% of your own state budget, by the way, is determined the, the spending that your actual state does with the own money raised in the state is dictated by the federal government. We tolerate that. They tell us how our cars are designed. They tell us what can be in the paint in our house. They tell us what we can do with the little puddle that develops on our front lawn when it rains. Good Lord, they tell us what kind of toilets we can have in our house, right? And so this is the antithesis of the idea of self-government. So if you feel uncomfortable inside, that's why. Because you're an American and in your DNA, going all the way back prior to the American Revolution, is this thing that nobody has the right to tell us what to do. Now, I want you to understand, this is unique in the world. If you've ever traveled overseas, the cultures are different, of course, everywhere you go. But there's a unique thing about the American culture. We are a DIY culture. We believe in doing things ourselves. You ever walk into a restaurant, there are eight of you, you see two tables there, each table has four seats, and you just think, well, we'll just push those tables together and we'll just sit down, there's eight of us. We'll sit. And that's not a big deal. That's a normal thing to do here in America. If you were to do that in Japan, oh my lord. <laughs> try that in China, try it in Germany. Like, people will scream at you. People will think you're crazy. What are you doing? You can't do that. Who told you you could do it? You're, you're like, I, we need eight seats. Right? And we take that for granted. And I know it's funny. But that's because we are a self-governing people. When we need something, we just kind of do it. And, but that's not normal in, in the world. We have a culture where we don't look to the boss man. We don't look to the big guy. We don't look to the authority to tell us what to do because we just have this inherent belief that, hey, I've always done what I think is right and that's what I'm always going to do. That's Levi Preston. You're Levi Preston. We're all Levi Preston. You don't have to believe that you're George Washington or Patrick Henry or Sam Adams or any of these guys, but you are Levi Preston, whether you know it or not. And revolutions are fomented and fought and won by the Levi Preston story. We take some leaders out there, some people that we know, the guys that make history, but without the Levi Prestons, there is no revolution. So to me, connecting to that history is an incredibly important thing. Knowing that history is a really important thing. And by the way, you can look that story up online. I don't think I tell it all that well, but you can read about Mellon Chamberlain and Levi Preston and that speech given in the North Church of Danvers. Really, I highly recommend that. You'll find it all over the place if you look it up online. Not taught in our schools, though, is it? So that brings me forward to the American Revolution. You have the revolution. After the revolution, obviously, we operate under the Articles of Confederation for a while, and that really doesn't work. It's kind of weird because we don't like the idea of a strong centralized government, but what we find is we've got no strength in the central government. we got a problem. And so we decide we have to get together in convention. And the history of convention is kind of important, the 1787 convention. And you guys focus on the Constitution, so I want to talk about that a little. Because I think we have a misimpression of that history. You know, before the 1787 convention, you get the Annapolis Convention. A lot of you guys have probably heard of that. And Five states gather in the Annapolis Convention. The convention purpose is stated to be to basically deal with commercial disputes that are taking place, business disputes. And five, only five states show up, and it doesn't, they don't want to get anything done, and they realize, wow, we got way bigger problems than just commerce problems and commercial problems. So 
We need to get all the stakes together. We don't have the authority to do that in this convention. So let's go home and let's suggest that the states get together in a broader convention. The first call for the broader convention is made by Virginia. And this is a place where history goes a little bit awry on us. Uh, how many people have heard that the, the Continental Congress or the Confederate Congress calls the convention of 1787, right? They say to, and they say, what do they say? To get together to amend the Articles of Confederation, right? And you guys have heard that before? And then we hear this story, which is the men who gathered in Independence Hall, well, they actually betrayed their commissions. They went well beyond what they were supposed to do, and they gave us a new constitution. And how many people have heard that? Have you heard that? Raise your hand if you heard that story. Right? So, I mean, we've all heard that. I heard that in school, and that's what I was taught. It's kind of the, the general common wisdom, that that's how the thing came down. And so, I want you to think about that story just in logical context first. This is really important. And I'm going to show you and prove to you that that story is not true. Hopefully, I can teach you something here tonight. So, I want you to imagine this. You know who the founders were. You've read a lot about them. You understand the concept of honor in the time of the founders, right? The concept of honor was held so high that if I were to call you a liar, you would have the right to call me out for a duel, and you could kill me. <laughs> and that's not murder. And that's justified. Everybody would say, well, yeah, he called you a liar. Right? You know, of course you called him out on a duel, and you murdered him. You shot him. It's fine. That's the way. This is how much these men valued their honor. They would rather die than be shamed. Die than lose their honor. And yet somehow, in this story, we are led to believe that people like Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, who presided over the convention, Madison, Adams, they all just decided, yeah, well, they told us to do one thing, but ah, we don't really care what people think. We're going to do something entirely different that we have no authority to do. That doesn't make any sense, does it? It seems really weird that men like that would betray their oath that they took from their states to only do certain thing and would just do something completely different. Now, what's said in hindsight on that as well, but thank God they did because we got this incredible constitution. In other words, these guys went and did something horrible, Ill illegal, unethical, dishonest, but God bless them for doing it. It's weird, right? It's like, well, George Washington was a great guy, but he was, really, he was also a, a British spy. No, that doesn't make sense because it's not true. It's not true. It's kind of interesting. About 10 years ago, a professor uh, from the University of Montana Law School named Rob Nadelson went to the National Archives and he actually pulled the commissions of every commissioner to the convention. These documents, imagine nobody had ever looked at them. They were saved. They were there, sealed up in a box in the National Archives. And he pulled those actual commissions and he read them. And by the way, when he started to do this, he was an opponent of Article 5 the idea of using our body. Pulls these commissions, he reads them, and almost all of them contain this language, or something very close to this. The commissioner has any and all authority necessary to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. Any and all authority necessary. It didn't say anything about the Articles of Confederation. It didn't say anything about amendments to the article. It said, go fix this. We're in big trouble. The country's falling apart. It's not working. Whatever you got to do, we don't care what you got to do. Go do it. Now, that makes sense to me because these great men that were in Independence Hall followed their commissions. So, Chris, so this is a great lie, and in my opinion, needs to be corrected. This is the greatest slander in American history, the slander of our founders that they breached their oaths, that they were dishonest, disreputable men that went to Philadelphia and did whatever the heck they wanted. It's not true. These men lived up to their oaths to the letter of law. Two delegations, by the way, did not have authority and did not vote in convention. Right? So nobody breaches their authority, and they draft this incredible document that you and I now know as the United States Constitution. Something incredible and amazing to me happens during this time period. You know, I think the most important date in American history, to me, is September 15th. And the reason I say that is because, well, that's my wife's birthday, and if I don't say that, I'm in big trouble. But it's also, coincidentally, the day that Colonel George Mason, two days before the end of the Constitutional Convention, stands and addresses the Assembly. Mason, the author of the Virginia Plan, Mason, the man who brings more to that convention than anybody else, says more, more of Madison's notes reflect Mason's opinion than anybody else. Mason stands and he says something like this. Several gentlemen, we have a terrible problem with this document that we've written. We've given the power to Congress to propose amendments should they deem them necessary, but we failed to give that same power to the people acting through their states. 
And then he asks a question, which I think is still important today. Are we so naive that we believe that a federal government that becomes a tyranny will propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? I hear some snickers. I'm pretty sure the founders snickered. The framers in that room snickered. I wish we had video, but I'm just as sure as if we did have video, and here's why, because Madison's notes are incredible, right? I don't know if you've read them, but Madison's notes in the convention, they're so thorough, you can tell exactly what's like being there. And Madison's notes in this place say something really unusual. They say, nin hum. That's it. Two little Latin words that mean no comment, no debate, no discussion, no objection. Not one of those men in that hall said, oh, this is a crazy idea, or what are you talking about, or I don't understand. They all, it was a forehead slap. They all thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe we forgot to do this. And so he proposes to include the second clause of Article 5 that gives you, you, and you, and you, and you, and me, acting through our state legislatures, the power to call a convention of states to propose amendments, specifically why, what did Mason tell us? To restrain federal tyranny. They had experience with this. They knew that a centralized government would get too powerful, would run away, and would cause them problems, and that the people would have to rise up. And so they gave us a tool. They gave us the second clause of Article 5. And they did it, by the way, unanimously. It's the only thing I'm aware of, no debate, and is adopted unanimously into the United States Constitution. They debated everything. They did not debate this. No negotiation, no horse trading, no debate. Boom. Got to do it? Yep. We all agree. And it's in there in the Constitution. They talked about it in the Federalist Papers. And, and there were a lot of debates, a lot of arguments that took place in the papers at the time. By the way, there were only 14 newspapers in the colony at the time of the American Revolution. And I forget that sometimes. And so the newspapers were... Few but powerful. And there, there were debates where they said, look, even if we got this whole thing wrong, I and mean, we got Article 5 in there, it, the people can propose amendments, we can change the Constitution if we need to. So this was part of the reason that the Constitution was actually ratified, because they knew that the people had the power to change it if they needed to. So let's fast forward now a lot of years into the future, and I'm going to insert myself briefly into the story. Maybe as the level of a Levi Preston, maybe, but not really. I haven't had to put my life on the line and my family on the line. Now, a lot of you know I came out of the Tea Party movement. I never intended to be a political activist. I was never, I never ran for office and never will run for office. I'm not suited for office. I'm unelectable and I don't have the right temperament. Although after seeing Donald Trump, I, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, and I was just living a quiet life in a small town in Northern California when the Tea Party movement. And I raised my hand. I held a protest in Sacramento, California. 150 people showed up. Uh, I ended up networking with a bunch of people who had held similar kinds of protests. And next thing I knew, the media, literally, in California said I was the Tea Party leader in California. <laughs> and the only reason that happened, it shows you how the media works, because I called a bunch of people. And so somebody would ask, a media person would say, well, who knows about this thing? I don't know. This guy, Meckler, from Northern California called me. And literally, I started seeing my name in, in the paper as Mark Meckler, the coordinator of the Tea Party in California. I didn't coordinate anything, by the way. And so that happened, and we, then I started to network around the country, and I met some people who were doing the same thing I was in other states. And a core group of about six of us got together and said, we did this thing in February of 2009. What if we had a few months to plan it? Could we make it bigger? Because at that point, we had 35 of these Tea Parties, 39,000 people showed up. Most people don't even know that happened in February. So we planned the one for tax day, uh, 2009. We end up having 850 of them all over the country. Neil Cavuto comes out and covers the one I hold in Sacramento. 20,000 people show up. Uh, we have Atlanta with Sean Hannity. We have Washington, D.C. with Greta Van Susteren. Uh, and it seems appropriate somehow. Glenn Beck went to the Alamo. <laughs> Last day in kind of place. So we do this, and when I come out of that, I feel called. Some of the folks that I was working with said, you know, we're going to go back to our regular lives. And I just thought, man, something's happening in America. I don't know what it is. I feel like I have an opportunity to play a role. I think something's being put in front of me, and I think I should follow that. And thank God I have such an incredible wife. I, I married way up, and uh, she was willing to sacrifice. And so we started working to build the Tea Party movement. We didn't know anything about running a nonprofit organization. And you said 501c3 organization. We didn't know what that was back then, right? We were just, just didn't know. All we were doing is thinking maybe we can help save the country. So we grow this big organization in the process. Uh, Patty and I spend literally all of the money we've ever saved. There's a very important moment in my life that I'll never forget. If you've been married any length of time, you've had this conversation with your spouse. 
Uh, we were laying in bed late one night and uh, we were talking about we couldn't pay our mortgage, we couldn't make the truck payment, and we were just out of money and uh, didn't know what to do. And other than pray about it and talk about it as a couple, and my wife said, um, we, should, we should raid the kids college fund. It's still hard for me to talk about that. It's, a, it's an incredible thing when, I, th I think especially for a woman, for a wife, uh, women are, tend to be more security conscious than sometimes we are. And for her to be willing to put that online, and she said, it's better to have a country where it's worth your kids going to college than to be able to pay for your kids to go to college. And so we did. And uh, honestly, I, I don't know why, I can't say we deserve this, but by the grace of God, ultimately, a donor stepped up, started giving us a little bit of money. We were saved from bankruptcy. We went on to build this huge Tea Party organization. I, and you know, sometimes people will say, uh, Mark Becker, I hear this all the time, actually, and it kind of bothers me. So I'm just going to put it on the line. People say, Mark Meckler, co-founder of the Tea Party movement. And I think that's very funny because to me that's like, you know, you come out of the surf and you're, you've surfed the perfect wave. You're a surfer and you come out and somebody goes, wow, that's a really nice wave you built, Mark. <laughs> no. Right? So I will take a little credit for being able to stand on the board when it was really scary. But the American people built the Tea Party movement. That was a wave that existed in the hearts and minds of the American people. And we were privileged to give that a vehicle. In 2012, uh, we won the 2010 election. It was incredible, right? The biggest wave uh, turned since 1938 between the parties. It was incredible. Who, who participated in that? 2010, sorry. Uh, who, who participated in that wave? The Tea Party wave of 2010? You guys were out there, right? You guys made that happen. So that happens, and I was ecstatic, and I went to Washington, D.C., and we had a big election party night in 2010. We had like 500 people in the ballroom. We knew we were going to win. It was unbelievable. And I knew that everything was about to change. Washington, D.C. was about to be cleansed. The plug had been pulled on the swamp. They were going to be accountable to the American people once again. And I could go back to coaching my kids' soccer team and riding horses. And it was incredible because what happened? Yeah, nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. I was naive. I didn't understand the depth of the swamp, the complexity of the system, the amount of money that went into keeping it exactly the way it was. It was a disaster. I watched those guys get eaten by the swamp faster than their first lunch break. It was unbelievable to watch. And then 2012, they tell us that, well, you know, if we just have the Senate, it's going to be incredible because right now we only have one third of it. And if we don't get the Senate, we got nothing. And if we get the Senate, everything's going to be different. It was incredible, right? We got the Senate, and it's just amazing because <laughs> wait, they have repealed Obamacare. No, they didn't do that. Either, right? Okay, so nothing happened. And so now I'm thinking my eighth grade understanding of civics is all wrong. Because what I got taught is if you work for people, if you support people, if you give money to people, if you help people get elected, then they go to Washington, D.C. and they do the things that they promised to do. That's what I was always taught. But it didn't work out that way. And even today, right, we got told, well, now if we could just get the presidency. I, don't, I can't even count the number of times that Republicans campaigned on this. Look, if you give us the presidency on the first day, we're going to put a full repeal of Obamacare on his desk, which they did eight times when President Obama was president, knowing he wouldn't sign it. How many times did they put that on President Trump's desk? Never. Zero. They never even tried to repeal. Incredible. So what I realize is the system is entirely broken. It's not just about electing people. That doesn't work. So in 2012, in the midst of this, out of my frustration, I left the Tea Party group that I had founded. The group raised $14 million that year. We had 23 million members. We were entirely successful. And I felt like I was just part of the problem. Like, what was I actually doing? Why was I raising money? If we couldn't change the system, what? I didn't want to be one of these guys who was a perpetual activist who had a fancy office in Washington, D.C. I just wanted to be home riding horses. And it wasn't worth it to me to participate in anything if we couldn't fix anything. And people were asking me, what do you do? What do we do? What do we do? And that's okay if you're sitting around having a couple of beers with your friends saying, what do you do? But what if you're a guy like me that skits in front of the room and people are legitimately asking, what do we do? And I'm saying, I don't know. That's not an acceptable answer for somebody who was in my position. And I was very burdened by that. And a guy named Michael Ferris came to me. Anybody know the name Michael Ferris? So Mike's the founder of the homeschool movement in America. Most people don't know this. 1973 homeschooling is illegal in all 50 states. <coughs> Hard to imagine. But the government had essentially, one way or another, outlawed the idea that we can homeschool our kids. 
Mike Paris was a young constitutional attorney who decided this was fundamentally wrong and decided to fight that fight. Now, I would argue that's impossible. It's impossible to do that. There were no cell phones at the time. There was no internet at the time. They had fax machines. That was really high tech, right? So, phone, like old-fashioned church tree, phone trees, right, and fax machines. He organized the national movement, and I think that we can all say a nice little prayer of gratitude for Mike when we go to sleep tonight because we have the homeschool movement in America because Mike is now legal in all 50 states. So he comes to me, and he asks me if I'm happy with what I've accomplished in politics, and I tell him absolutely not. I'm miserable. And he says, that's because you're going after the wrong problem. You think that we have a personnel problem when we have a structure problem. You can put as many good people in Washington, D.C. as you want, but we have a broken structure. And as long as that structure is broken, you're going to get bad results out of Washington, D.C. And I was very intrigued by that. I'm a structure guy. I'm a systems guy. I like to try to figure out how things work. And I asked him what he meant. And he gave me some very specific examples. And I'll give a couple of them to you tonight. We had about an hour conversation. One of the things he said to me is, where do you find in the United States Constitution the authority for things like the Department of Education, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Transportation, Housing and Urban Development, the EPA? And I said, well, they're not there. I'm a lawyer. I know they're not there. And, and so uh, you find them because the Supreme Court invented them. And he said, exactly. The Supreme Court invented them. They're not in the Constitution. But the Supreme Court invented them. And he said, so how do you fix that? If, if we don't believe that those things should exist, if we believe that they're fundamentally intended not to be constitutional except by amendment, and we don't have it, how do you fix that? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, Article 5. You call a convention. This is what the founders intended. You call a convention, you rise up, and you strip the federal government of that authority because we've broken our system of governance. Here's another example of how we've broken the system of governance. 1913 is, by my estimation, the worst year in American politics in the history of the country. In 1913, we get the 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, the Federal Reserve, and one that most people don't know anything about. Ever wonder why there are 435 members in the House of Representatives? It's a weird number. It's not an even number. It doesn't seem to have any relationship to anything. I never even thought about it. It just is. I guess maybe I would have assumed it was in the Constitution or something. The reason is, is because in 1913, Congress in its infinite wisdom decided, hmm, that's enough. And they passed the Reapportionment Act of 1930. It's just a law. We could change that law tomorrow, by the way. It's 435. There was a debate at the convention in 1787 about what the right number of representative uh, uh, people in any given representative's district was. And the debate was 30,000 or 50,000. Average number of people in a, in a represent, representative's district today in the United States Congress is 700,000. Some of them are over a million. The founders knew one person can't represent 100 or 700,000 people's interests. They believe you can represent 100,000 people's interests. According to the original formula of 50,000, we should be over 6,220 representatives in the House of Representatives. It's a huge number. You know what people say to me? My friends on the left will say this. Well, if you had 6,220 people in the House of Representatives, you couldn't get anything done. Yeah. And I say, yes. <laughs> exactly. That sounds awesome. It was supposed to be hard to get stuff done. Now it's way too easy for them to get stuff done, and they do a lot of bad stuff. So 1913, we get all these structural things that happen. They break our country. 17th Amendment provides for the direct election of United States senators. U.S. senators, this is, to me, the most beautiful balance point in the system of the founders. The senators were intended to represent the state. Not you, not me, not the people, the state as an entity. They were essentially the lobbyists for the state. And they were controlled by the state legislature. Imagine this. Imagine your senator, controlled by and appointed by the state legislature, goes to Washington, D.C., and he comes up one day and he says to his bosses in the legislature, I have something very exciting to tell you. This is incredible. There's this new thing called an unfunded mandate. It's amazing because it's going to cost you billions of dollars here in Massachusetts. It's going to impose a bunch of rules on you that you have no say over. You have to raise the money for it. Washington, D.C. is not going to give you any money, and I voted for it. <laughs> in in the fam words of our, famous words of our president, I think the next words are, you're fired. Because United States senators had one primary job, and it was to prevent the encroachment of the federal government on state authority. That's why they were put there. And we broke that very beautiful balance in 1913 with the 17th Amendment by saying we directly elect them. 
So these are some of the structural things Mike Ferris brought to my attention. And I said, okay, what do we do? And he said, we hold a convention of states. And I said, yeah, Mike, that's big. That's never been done. You know, what's it take? Well, you got to get 34 states to agree. Well, that's a lot. That's two thirds of the states. And he said, yeah, but we can do it. There's a plan to do it. We need to get actual, what we call district captains, and say 4,000 districts around the country, about 7,300 state legislative districts, give or take a few roughly. And we need to get district captains in about 4,000 to 5,000 of them. We need 100 volunteers in each district. Those people need to call their state legislator and tell them to call a convention of states. I said, really? Is that it, really? He said, yeah, that's it. You're the Tea Party guy, I'm the homeschool guy. I think we can get this done. And I said, okay, I'm crazy, I'm in. And we agreed to fund this effort. So that's how Convention of States is born. I'm going to tell you a little story about this too. How many people will listen to Mark Levin? Oh, I mean, you make me so happy. I'm going to call him afterwards and tell him. <laughs> so Mark's actually a really good friend of mine. And he was a friend of mine from the Tea Party. He was the only guy in the media that I consider a friend. Mark's true blue, man. You want to know a guy that bleeds red, white, and blue? That's Mark Levin. He lives and dies and breathes this stuff. He would do anything for this country. So around the time we're getting ready to start this organization, I, uh, I know Mark's working on a book, but I don't know what it's about. And uh, I always know when Mark's working on a book because anybody think Mark's a little bit cranky sometimes? <laughs> he's extra cranky when he's working on a book. Mark writes all his own books, no research assistant, nothing. So Mark's, I know he's working on a book. I don't even ask him about it. He doesn't talk about his books when he's working on them. They're uh, embargoed by the publisher. He's not allowed to talk about them in advance or really say what they are until right before he puts them out. So I was on a panel in Tucson, Arizona. Hugh Hewitt was the host of this panel. Mark Levin Skypes into the panel. And I didn't know this was going to happen, but we get to ask him a question. And so I'm, I think pretty quickly on my feet. And I'm you know, self-serving. I'm in politics. You got to be a little bit self-serving. And so I asked him a question about Convention of States. And I said, hey, Mark, you know, to me, it seems like we've lost our government. We elect people that we think are going to do what we want. They don't do what we want. We saw the Tea Party wave. It didn't work. And so it seems to me we have to use Article 5, call a convention of states, and restrain federal tyranny. What do you think about that? He gave me an answer I will never forget. He said, uh, I, uh, I thought, uh, well, I, um, uh, and I could see him on the screen. He was skyped in and he looked very confused. And he said, I just, uh, I'm writing a book. I can't really talk about it, uh, but I agree with you. Because the entire Levin answer, right? So I'm the Levin. And I'm sitting up there just baffled, like, I don't, do you not understand what I was asking? Do you like it? Do you not like it? I was actually pretty disappointed because I wanted him to say what a great idea I had. <laughs> so he doesn't, and he goes on to the next person asking the question. You can see Levin sitting up there, and you can picture him in his baseball cap and his scruffy beard. He's looking down while the next person is asking, asking a question. And I have my phone sitting on the table in front of me. And he texts me while the next person is asking a question. And the text says, call me as soon as you're done. We need to talk. And I think, yes. All right. He's in. This is incredible. I'm so excited. So I literally, normally I'll stick around and talk to everybody. I bolt out to the foyer as soon as I'm done speaking. And I call him in. And he answers the phone. And in my ear is full tirade Mark Levin on a personal level. And he's mad. It's like a pit viper, and he's screaming at me. And there are things that I can't repeat in a polite audience that he's saying to me. And how dare you, and you have no right, and nobody knows, and you probably caused me to breach my contract, and I don't even know how you knew. And I mean, and I'm on the other end, just, but I, because I, 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 I had no idea what he was talking about. And when he finally takes a breath, I said, Mark, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he just stops and he says, why did you ask me that question? And I explained to him that I had started this project with Mike Ferris, and I, I just think that this is what we need to do. And there was a long pause, and he said, that's not coincidence, that's providence. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know I'm working on a book. And I said, yeah. And he said, it's called Liberty Amendments. It's about Article 5, because I believe the only way to save the country is to call an Article 5 Convention of States restrain federal tyranny. And my only fear was, I'm a writer, I'm a talker, I'm a thinker, I don't know how to do this stuff. Like, I'm not an activist, I'm not a political guy, and so I just worried that there was just going to be an idea on a shelf. And now you come along and you say you and Mike are doing this. So that's where this movement comes from. That's why Mark Levin is such a huge supporter of ours, because it's providential that we came together on this. This was A lot of people think that 
uh, Mark and you launched this project together, it could not be further from the truth. So that's how the project comes to be. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, kind of what's happened since then and where we're at now. So when that happened, as you can imagine, and Mark launches the book, things just explode. Again, you could say I founded this project, but I would say I just am riding the wave. Because that happens and we go from a sleepy little operation that has no idea what it's doing to a sleepy operation with tens of thousands of people signing up and calling in and asking. It. We have no idea what we're doing. I have three employees at the time. And so we're looking for people who want to be state directors. You guys have Michael here, who's our state director, doing a great job. Back then, a guy like Michael would call in and say, hey, I'm interested in volunteering. We'd say, great, you're our state director. <laughs> and, and he would say, well, what does that mean? And we'd say, we don't know, but it's going to be awesome. <laughs> we'll figure it out. And that's literally how little we knew when we started. So here we are. Uh, it'll be six years uh, in August. August 23rd will be six years. Here we are today. There are about four million people involved in the movement nationally. We have volunteers in every state legislative district in the nation, 100% of them. By the way, aren't there, there's some people here from New Hampshire? Who's anybody here from, okay. We actually had to send a guy in a pickup truck driving around New Hampshire to get the last couple of districts because there's so few people in some of your districts and I don't think they have computers or something. <laughs> so we actually sent a guy out in a pickup truck to, into some districts. Because I kept saying, look, I'm tired of getting on TV and saying 99% of all the lady calls in the state of districts. So we cover the entire country. Uh, we are building what I would describe as the largest self-governing grassroots army in the history of the world. That's, that's the goal. And we are going to call a convention today. 15 out of the 34 necessary states have already passed the resolution through both houses, most recently Mississippi, Arkansas, and Utah. Got a few more states pending this year. I was just in uh, Michigan day before yesterday. I think we have a pretty good shot in the Michigan legislature this year. Uh, so Ohio, Pennsylvania, those are year-round legislatures where we're still working this year. My goal is to get to 17 or 18 states this year before we close out the year. I'll close with this and then I, I want to go to questions because I think this is the most important thing I can do uh, is answer your questions. Um, what else are we going to do? I would guess that everybody in this room or the vast majority of people in the room, I'd like to take a survey. How many think that this country is headed off a cliff right now? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's pretty much universal. So the question is, what do we do about that? Sometimes people who object to what we're doing say, well, what we need to do is put better people in office. We need to vote, right? Well, you know, they, you know what they say about the definition of insanity, right? <laughs> and so I've just not found anything else that can solve the problems that ail the nation. Some people say to me, you know, Mark, I love the Constitution so much, and I'm just scared of opening it up, and I don't want to change it. And the Constitution is perfect just the way it is if they would just follow it. Right? I want to show you something. So this is, probably a lot of you carry these around. I know you guys were giving them out out front. If you don't have one, you should have one. You should read it. You should carry it. It's super important that you know what's in it. People say, just this one. Let's just stick to this and love this and live by this. And I say, that is a fantastic fantasy. <laughs> because that's not our Constitution anymore. This is the Constitution the founders gave us. But it's not our constitution. We don't live under this one anymore. I, I wish we did. I pray that someday we'll live under something like that again. I want to show you what the constitution of the United States looks like today. I venture a guess that nobody in this room has ever seen this. <laughs> now, you might say that's not the constitution, Mark, but the government would disagree with you. You can order this from the government printing office. It weighs almost 10 pounds. It's hard for me to travel with. I don't always bring it because it's kind of a pain. On the spine it says... The Constitution of the United States of America. That's it. Nothing else. So you and me might think that it's this. But our federal government says that it's this. Right? This contains every case ever issued by the United States Supreme Court telling us, simple mere mortals, the, the unwashed masses, what this means. I find that outrageous. Just in constant. As a lawyer, right? All of us can read this document. Anybody have any trouble knowing what this means? I don't have any trouble knowing what it means. So when they issue this to tell us what this means, here's what it means. It means one of two things. Either they, who write all these opinions and the government that lives by them, either means the founders were so stupid and so obtuse and so dim-witted that they wrote a document that's so difficult to understand in these 14 pages that it takes 
This is 2,738 pages without supplement to explain it to us. Because this is just obviously so terrible and so poorly drafted. Or it means this is so well drafted and finely crafted, it's a beautiful document, but they believe you and me are so stupid that it takes over 3,000 pages to explain it to us. <laughs> Neither of those things are true. The truth is, this is a beautifully, finely crafted, amazing document. And it is my intent, and it is my life's work to get us from here as close to here as I can. And that's what we're here for tonight. That's why I'm here. That's why I go out. That's why I spend all this time on the road away from my family. I'm a homebody. I'd rather be home with my beautiful wife. I've got two big old great games I love. The three of us barely fit on the couch. <laughs> and we love to snow the guy. I'd rather be there doing that. You know, I was home watching the Stanley Cup last night. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's probably a raw subject. I was worried what it might be like in the airport today if they won. It might have been crazy, right? Uh, so that's why I do what I'm doing. I have a daughter who is about to be a senior at Hillsdale College. Anybody like Hillsdale College? It's even better. Whatever you think, it's even better than that. I'll tell you. I love it there at Hillsdale. And it's, it's turned her from an incredible young lady to something just so astronomically above anything I could have expected. I highly recommend it. I have a son who just came out of four years in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, really proud of him for serving his country. And he's getting ready to go to George Mason, how's that? Scalia School of Law in Virginia. The only really conservative law school in America, uh, other than maybe Liberty. So I do it for them. And the reason I do it for them is because I can't look my kids in the eye, or for my parents for that matter, who's still alive and, and humming along. I can't look any of them in the eye and say, look, I know the country's going over the abyss, but eh, we just got to vote for you. I can't do that. We have to give the American people a plan. We have to provide hope. We have to show a roadmap away from the edge of the abyss. And the only roadmap that I am aware of was provided by the founders in Article 5 of the United States Constitution. And I think if, if one of them were in here tonight, and probably the one I think about the most when I'm using my imagination trying to imagine what they think is Ben Franklin, because he was so cantankerous. Kind of was probably a lot like Mark Levin, don't you think? <laughs> and I imagine saying to Ben Franklin, you know, Ben, I'm so frustrated because look at this thing, man. Obamacare and Obergefell and the Commerce Clause and blah, 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 blah. And I imagine Ben saying, well, Mark, how about Article 5? I mean, we gave you Article 5 for this, right? Have you tried it? And I think I'd be embarrassed. Oh, we just have uh, people are scared and uh, we're not sure. And, and I think he would say, Get out of here. Go do it and come back and tell me when you've tried. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to get it done. I know we're going to get it done. And hopefully we're going to get it done with your help. What you can do is become a part of this movement. You are Levi Preston. When you go home at night and, and tonight after this, and you go home and you're standing in front of the mirror and you're brushing your teeth. I hope you brush your teeth. <laughs> you go home and you brush your teeth in front of that mirror. When you look in that mirror, don't think that, well, I'm just one person, I can't do anything. Think about Levi Preston and ask yourself, can you stand in his shoes? Can you be Levi Preston, just a regular person who is willing to come out and put it online? I think the answer for all of us is yes, you love this country deeply. I know each of you do, at least as much as I do. And so do something. Get engaged. Talk to Michael. Talk to the team. Ask how you can volunteer. What we really need is to grow the team. The only way we make it happen is a grassroots movement. The politicians are not going to lead the way on this. The powers that be, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they're not going to lead the way on this. Only you're going to lead the way. So I want to thank you guys for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. And let's go ahead and take some questions. State Director for Convention of States of Massachusetts, and I really need your help to make this happen in Massachusetts. We already have legislation that can be can help. We need the district captains to pull this together to force this upon them. With that being said, who has the first question? Let's say magic happens, and mm -hmm. 10 years from now, you've got all the states. 
What Two happens? Years. Two years. <laughs> make, it a year like a, make it a year and a half. Okay. Uh, what, hap <clears throat> what happens then? Sure, so the process goes like this. Yeah. Once 34 states make what's called an application, they pass a resolution, the states get together in convention. They actually each send a delegation made of people called commissioners, and they're limited in what they can talk about. Mm -hmm. There are three things they're allowed to talk about, and only three things, because this is what each resolution says in every state. They're all the same. It says they can talk about anything that would put fiscal restraints on the federal government, something like a balanced budget amendment, imposing generally accepted accounting principles on them because they actually don't count like human beings do, right? <laughs> and maybe imposing taxation limits or spending limits on them. Second would be anything that would impose term limits. Anybody like the idea of term limits? Uh, yeah. 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 When are they going to impose term limits on themselves? Never. Yeah. 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 So term limits, but not just for Congress. How about term limits for federal judges, including the Supreme Court? You know, so that we have everybody on the Supreme Court actually still alive. I think that would be good. And so term limits also on bureaucrats and staffers in Washington. See, nobody intended for the swamp to be a career when this country was founded. So term limits. And the last thing is the one I think is the meat of the matter is limitations on the scope, the power, and jurisdiction of the federal government. Let's say, like, no, you may not be involved in education. Period. End of story. And so these are the things they would consider. Each state would commission its delegates or its commissioners. Those commissioners would have limitations on their authority placed by the call of the convention itself, but then by anything that the state wanted to limit them further. And those commissions, same as the commissions that the commissioners to the 1787 convention. Whatever they want to limit, they can put it on. The states get together in convention, and they will debate these subject matter areas. We held, you can see this on our website, we actually held a simulated convention in Williamsburg two years ago. It was incredible. We, bought, we brought in sitting and retired legislators from all over the country, 150 commissioners, and they debated the three subject matter areas, came up with a slate of amendments, delayed, they debated them in committee, just like the legislature would do, broken out in committees by subject matter, came back to the floor, and they proposed six amendments that passed out of there. Now, so it takes 26 states to get something out of convention, majority. When something comes out of convention, and this is very important because people will say, oh my God, convention, it's so terrifying. What if something goes wrong in convention? And the answer is, if something goes wrong in convention, then they are going to make a bad suggestion. Anybody scared if somebody makes a bad suggestion to you? It's like, hey, mom, why don't we throw a little gasoline on that fire? No, son, that's a bad idea, right? That's what a suggestion is. That's what comes out of convention, is a suggestion. Because then it has to go out to the states, and it takes 38 states, or three quarters of the states, to ratify anything. And people will say, well, you never know what's going to happen, Mark. I get told all the time, well, we're going to lose the Second Amendment. Well, here's the deal. It takes, do the math, flip the math on its head. I'm from California, so help me if I get this wrong. If it takes 38 states to ratify, it means it takes only 30, 13 states to stop something, right? That would be, in my estimation, the 13 most conservative states in America. Places like Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina, the Dakotas. I mean, places like Texas, where I'm from. And so people are worried about losing the Second Amendment. I'm just going to tell you, because I've been to all these state legislatures, if you're going to go into those states and suggest they ratify an amendment, repealing or even touching the Second Amendment, I hope you're packing heat. Because they're going to chase you out in a very armed and hostile way. So that's how the process works. Once 38 states ratify, it actually becomes part of the United States Constitution. So that's how the process works. Yes, sir. How many delegates you might have... You might have said this already, uh, but I was thinking through the question, so I missed a couple of words. How many delegates are assigned per state? The states, this is one of my favorite things about convention. It worries some people. I actually love it, which is it's truly federalist. The state can send as many delegates as they want. Each state gets one vote, but you can send 100 delegates. You know, remember, I come from California. They're going to send a psychedelic bus full of 100 stone <laughs> They'll be about three weeks late, so they may not have any. Every state decides and every state limits the authority of their delegation and gives their delegation the authority to convene and vote in whatever way they determine. But each state will have only one vote. Thanks. Uh, I have a, two questions. Really. One is, by the way, you asked who um, participated in the Tea Party thing years ago. And nobody down here did because we live in a very gerrymandered district, which goes from the Cape, which is relatively conservative, up to grab Quincy, which has got a lot of union people, yep. and all the way up to Fall River. And that makes it democratic. So our votes don't count, just so you know. I'm from California, so <laughs> pretty much the whole state. <laughs> well, I think it goes the way. And actually, um, a couple years ago, I looked into this, and um, I think we have a lot of division country, and uh, what's the, the brochure here? It says conservatives need to do this. I don't believe that. I believe 
people on both sides of the spectrum would respect all three things that you mentioned. And I felt like the materials I was looking at was not something I could sell here. Yeah, I, and I think that's a very and, that's a very fair comment. And uh, so I'm hoping that um, as we go forward, we can find a way to. You're not going to get that sale in Massachusetts. We only have nine. Yep. Republicans. Yep. And today's Republicans in Washington are not, no longer conservatives. Yep. Agreed. Um, so that's my yep. real hope that we can develop something that can make the system and go after the other half by appealing to what people know needs to be done. So uh, I think this is a super important point, and I would argue a very sophisticated point. So uh, I would love for this to be entirely bipartisan. And there are a lot of folks across the country that, for example, in Pennsylvania, we just got two Democrat sponsors on this. They tend to be Democrats that are in more conservative blue collar areas, and so their folks really like this. Uh, but I want you to think about this as if it were a presidential campaign, only maybe a 10 year presidential campaign or an eight year presidential campaign. In any campaign, you have a primary part of the cycle, and then you have a general election part of the cycle. And in your primary part of the cycle, what you do is you work to consolidate your base. That's what you have to do. You play to your base. And so uh, there's two reasons for this. One is just practical playing to the base. Uh, if you think about who's our natural base, it's really 62 million Trump voters, basically. People who are fed up with the status. Not because they love Trump, but because they're fed up with the status quo. So that's our base, our natural base. Uh, and then I want you to think about who started this. And so I started it, Mike Ferris, where Mike comes out of the evangelical Christian movement. I'm a Tea Party guy. Uh, Mark Levin endorses it. This is a, a difficult problem that I don't think is easy to solve. I think you've identified something important. It's difficult because the people who naturally gravitate towards this are conservatives. And the reason is this, truly on the left in America, people on the left don't think about the Constitution. They really don't think about it. This is a, it's a new thing. We're hearing them talk about the Constitution now that Trump's in office. <laughs> but I think back for most of your lifetime, the left just doesn't talk about the Constitution. They don't have the same attachment to the founding we do or to the founding ideals. Or, and I'm not saying that as a criticism, just as an observation. It's just a different way of relating to the country. And so it is difficult to find public figures on the left that will support this. And it's not for lack of trying. And I believe what will happen, though, is over time, as we get closer and closer to convention, they're going to want to have a voice. And so they will start to come in. But my goal initially, we have about 4 million people right now. I think we need 30 million to get this done, roughly. And so first, we have to appeal to the base and the people who naturally endorse us and are naturally attracted are much more conservative. But I, you've identified what I believe is a genuine problem in the long run. I actually fit that profile. Charlie Baker is a Republican governor here. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the identification, what you just said, the identification of people on the left and people on the right. Well, there's a whole bunch of people that actually are neither the extremes that we now identify as the two popular parties. I agree with you. Yeah, and, I, I and totally agree. The problem is you gotta you got to market this to appeal to those people. So we do that as well. When I polled this recently all over the country. And here's how it polls. First of all, most people have no idea what a convention states is. I, I don't remember what the exact number is, probably 95% don't know. Uh, and when we tell them what it is and lay out the three subject matter areas, these are the numbers how they break down. Uh, it's pretty consistent state to state. About 75% of Republicans are in support, about 66% of self-identified independents are in, are in support, and 52 to 55% Democrats. Those are the numbers that we generally get across the country. Other questions? Yes, sir. Recent history uh, proved that uh, we have a huge uh, cancer in, in the government. This is the corruption. Uh, have you guys uh, thought of a mechanism which can be implemented to prevent uh, uh, corruption to be, to be part of uh, the convention, as far as convention is? Yeah, you know, I mean, so corruption is a very broad term. And so I, I want to address a, different, a couple different kinds of corruption that I think we can address that are important. I think we, you know, people talk about money and politics, and they're concerned about money and politics causing the corruption. I'm not concerned at all about money and politics. I just want to say that in a presidential cycle, as a country, we spend more money on potato chips than we do on the presidential cycle. That's an actual fact. It's unbelievable. So we're like, oh my God, we spend so much money on a presidential election, no, we're eating more potato chips than we spend getting information about a presidential election. So I'm not worried about that. And if you go to Washington, D.C., and you see how the money flows, 
There are very tight limits on how people can give money to candidates. Right? So when a lobbyist giving money, no, that doesn't happen. Because right? the, the limits are so tight. They do write checks, but they're small. They're like 2500 bucks. They do an election that costs millions of dollars. That's a very small amount of money. Here's where I think the deepest corruption is for money in Washington, D.C. that should be addressed. It's the revolving door. Right? So if you're a congressman and I come into your office and I'm a lobbyist, I'm wearing a $3,000 suit, I'm wearing a Rolex, and you know that I have my new Bugatti parked in the garage, right? And I'm telling you how great my life is, and we've got the place up in Martha's Vineyard, and we're going to the Caribbean this summer for a bit, and, and man, you'd be good at this job too when you got out. Wink, wink. McDonnell Douglas really needs your vote on this defense team. Right? It's never, and to be fair, I don't think it's ever said that bluntly, but it's pretty obvious that as a city congressman, senator, you can come out, you can make a million bucks a year as a lobbyist. And so you can go from 187,000 or you know whatever Ocasio-Cortez wants them to be paid now, uh, 192,000 to a million bucks a year, you can be set for life. That's a deep kind of corruption. That's a big problem. It's one of the reasons government always grows, because the incentive is give the contracts, give the favors, so that you can go out and be the guy that gets paid. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that's evil, I'm just saying humans are incentive machines. Right? And people are going to operate that way, so we need to prohibit that. And that's something you could do. Here's, a, here's another place in our, where I think we have a problem. That is, I'm not sure corruption is the right word, but federal judges. Oh. If you look at how federal judges rule over time, the longer they're on the bench, the more they rule in favor of big government. Now, there's no mystery there. They're federal government employees who hang out all day long with federal government employees, right? And again, I want to be really careful. I'm not impugning them for this. This is human nature. Like We like the people we hang out with. We like the people we work with. Generally speaking, we like our job. We like the system we work in. And so they become immune to the needs of ordinary Americans and even the Constitution and in favor of bigger and bigger government. So by putting term limits on the judiciary, you prevent that phenomenon from taking place. I think also term limits on Congress gets rid of some of the corruption. If people can't be there that long, then there's less chance to build in the corruption in the system. And I think there are other creative ways, too much detail to get into right now, but there are multiple ways to limit the corruption. Limiting the authority of federal prosecutors, I think, is one. The federal prosecutors are completely out of control in the United States of America. Prosecutors, frankly, at all levels in this country are kind of out of control. Question back here? Yes, sir. Um, sorry. Um, Actually, when you brought that book out, I thought that was the Internal Revenue Code. <laughs> I, I want to say that I think the biggest thing here, you've got to educate um, the generations behind us. Look at the median age of the folks in here. Yeah. We were taught these things in school, whether we were taught the right or wrong version. Yep. We were taught. Yes. And what I find is total ignorance. I'm not going to say point my finger and sweep all the left under, but I think the generations behind me are not learning these things. And in my neighborhood, um, there are, let's say, a lot of veterans, uh, ex-law enforcement. Uh, there is more of an urgency for us that, that I feel. I hear rumbles of civil war. And as a former Marine and... Um, I live five. quietly, thank you, uh, and I'm a law-abiding citizen, don't come for my guns. And that's that's just a fact, and that's the, the general feeling in, I live in, like I said, rural Virginia. And uh, if you want to look at uh, what the Second Amendment means there, just look up Article 13 of the Virginia Bill of Rights. And it actually describes the Second Amendment better than the Second Amendment. I agree with that. Yep. And, um, when you guys come down to Virginia, I'll volunteer for you. But you gotta get that education out there because these kids don't. Yeah, so let me, let me comment on that. I think this is really important. So one thing I wanna do is give you more hope uh, for the kids than what we see in this room. And here's the reason I say that. First of all, there are some young people in this room and I really appreciate that. But, but second of all, mostly, and even the young people who are here with us will tell you this, this is not how they work. <laughs> right, so for us, uh, we're used to getting together in meetings and churches, whatever, but that's just not how kids are today. And so if we expect that they're going to just act like us because this is just how we are as older people, then we're going to be mighty disappointed. And the reality is they're online, they're in 
they're you know, on Instagram, they're using Twitter. I'd say Instagram is one of the biggest places now. Mm -hmm. And and here's I can prove this to you. I'm not I'm not just being Pollyannish. Anybody listen to Ben Shapiro? Yeah. Yeah, yeah a bunch of Ben Shapiro fans in the room. I'm sure everybody who's under 35, their hands went up, right? Mm -hmm. Ben's a friend of ours too, an endorser of our project. And recently we we did a big run on Ben's show. We did a bunch of advertising on Ben's show. Uh, Mike back there in the corner, Mike Razor Hand, came in out of that series of advertising, right? So he's, uh, he's the guy who's in charge of technology for us here. We had over 45,000 people join the organization off of that, you know, that small series of advertising. 45,000, average age of his listeners under 35. So don't fear, I agree with you, kids aren't being taught today, but there are also is a whole wave of kids coming up. It's a whole movement called the Intellectual Dark Web. Uh, ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin, Jordan Peterson. There's a movement going on that, that people are seeking truth and they know they're not getting it in the school. So I'm actually more hopeful now for young people than I've been any time in modern history. Frankly. I, think that, I think they're coming our way. We have time for two more questions. Okay. Uh, so thanks so much for coming down here. Uh, as you said, the grassroots is going to be what drives the movement. What are the specific ways that people can get involved that are helpful um, in the movement at, at the state, you know, and the local level? Sure. So the very first thing is go to conventionofstates.com, learn more, and sign the petition. There's a petition there. When you sign it, it's not so that we can spam you with a bunch of stuff. It's so that. And, and we ask for your information, not because we want your information, because that's how we send your petition to your state legislator. Our system automatically will sort and send it to your particular state legislator so they know you're in support. And this matters to them, by the way. They get a whole stack of these things, all, and we keep track. And, you know, I can walk into a legislator and say, hey, Dave, in your district, there are 275 people that took the time to sign this thing and say they want you to support it. So number one, sign the petition. Number two, Click Get Involved and look at the volunteer positions. There's all kinds of volunteer positions in the state. Whatever you like to do, if you're a person who likes to be on the phone, uh, we're going to be doing some block walking. If you feel like getting out this summer and, and walking and knocking on doors and talking to people, people are really receptive to this. They've never heard of it. They're pretty stunned it exists when they hear about it. They're very thankful. Uh, if you like working on the computer, if you're a person who likes social media, we have social media warriors. We have people who work in the media. They're called our media liaisons. We're always looking for people to get engaged. And really, the answer is, if you like to do something, it's probably useful for convention states. It's just the biggest thing is look in the mirror and ask yourself what you're going to do to save the country. And then click Get Involved, click on your state, look at the volunteer positions, and figure out how you want to volunteer. One of these folks in the state is going to contact you personally, and Mike, heck there, is going to contact you and get you involved. We have one, one last question. It's right here in front. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I guess you sort of answered uh, it a little bit, but we, we have three... Um, uh, conservative groups on, on Cape that I know of. There's uh, We the People of Cape Cod, we have the Up Cape Tea Party, we have Liberty Chalkboard. It's always the same small group of people who are doing everything. And when we have an event, like Tuesday we had an event um, talking about the, the education stuff, the, the uh, author of Crimes of the Educators, that talks about how the progressive um, movement has been in the public schools for a, a century, basically. Um, and are teaching our kids how to be little socialists and communists. And, right. and, and one young mother came. We, we publicize it all over the Cape. We hang flyers everywhere. We, we go on the Ed Lambert show. Um, and it's always the same small group of people who show up to, uh, to all of these things. So what, what other ideas do you have to get people? Because we're, we're out there trying to educate the community. You know, having guest speakers like Mike invited right. you, and um, and you know this is a nice crowd, but a lot of times people just don't come. Yeah, look, I think this is really hard. This is kind of the essence of activism, and and we talk about this all the time. Uh, if you're if you're a church member, you belong to any charitable organization. If you're PTA mom, whatever it is, it's the eighty twenty rule, right? And so it's always well, a that's point. one of the things too. Is, we, we send invitations to the local churches. We talk to the pastors. We can't, other than Dr. Jaley, whose church you're in right now, he shows up to a lot of these things. Right. We can't get the other pastors to no, show up. So, no, so what I want to tell you is, is the question you're asking is a hard one. And and the, I think the reason that we don't have trouble getting volunteers, we have people coming in at the rate in the organization of a thousand a day, roughly, on average. I mean, it's incredible. Like I can't keep up with the people coming in. 
It's not that we have trouble recruiting people, we can't keep up. The reason I can tell you, uh, this is just a guess that it works for us, it's not my magnetic personality in charge. <laughs> but and the reason is because we give them hope. So I think sometimes, and I know this from doing activism for a long time, I go to these meetings and it's kind of dark. And we're talking about, well, we're in the minority and what can we really do? And, but we can tell you what the problems are, but it's hard to, and I'm not criticizing people, it's what's the fix? I, mean, I left California because I can't find the fix, right? So if you can't tell people that here's the fix and here's hope and here's something that can actually be achieved, then you know people don't want to go to the meeting because they got enough bad news in their life. And I'm not accusing you of that at all. I'm saying sometimes that's the situation. I mean, right? we, we always, the, our intention is to educate yep. and then, and then talk, discuss solutions yeah. and get people Involved. But it's but it's hard, and when you're in an area that is particularly of one party or the other, and you know you're swimming upstream, that's hard to motivate people. It's it's really hard. I see Silver Wolf back there. She's from New York. If you want to talk about a hard environment, right? <laughs> and they have a great group there working hard. So, uh, but I can tell you, for convention states, the reason I think it's so attractive to people is they don't know about it, and it gives them hope. So I want to close with this before I turn it back to you, uh, which is have hope. I'm, I'm out there, I'm all over the country, uh, things are, the, the people are uh, improving out there. The, the populace is getting more educated, there is a rising tide. You talked about a revolution, there is a revolution brewing. It's my hope that it's a peaceful revolution because the founders gave us the tools to conduct a peaceful revolution. That's up to you and me, people like us who lead groups like We The People. So thank you for having me, it's been a real honor. Really <laughs> Thank you for all attending, and um, thanks again to Mr. Meckler for joining us. Uh, I'm going to repeat that if you're interested in uh, getting involved with the administration of We the People, please see me. I'll be up here, and I'm sure Mark will be around for a little while in case there are any questions that uh, come up and you want to speak individually. Let me give you a little bit of hope. Uh, I'm an optimist, and I'm not an irrational optimist, <laughs> but I look at what's going on, and the Tea Party movement started about eight, nine, ten years ago. And you hear a lot of news that the Tea Party's dead now, it's all over, it's passe. Groups that were once coherent are disintegrating. I want you to understand something. Yes, we are on the edge, but we're walking along it. Nine years ago, we were hanging off the edge by our fingernails. And now, the Tea Party movement has brought us our first Tea Party president. So, there's lots of hope. You need to knock on your neighbor's doors. If anybody wants to know what you need to do to keep this going, to keep this recovery going, come up and talk to me. I'll tell you what you can do in your own neighborhood. And if you're not from this state, I'll tell you what you can do in another state like New Hampshire. Again, thank you for uh, Mark Meckler joining us. Thank you all for coming tonight. Have a great day.